Hi, friends. I'm Naya, mom, boob nerd, board-certified lactation consultant, and lover of lipstick and curse words. I'm that weird Indian girl you knew in high school, all grown up. And I'm Alexis, mom, birth nerd, and therapist plus doula, encouraging parents to hold joy plus what the fuck is this mess simultaneously. Some people think I'm too much, but those aren't my people. And And we we are the Top Top Knot Squad. TKS is a tiny little podcast about motherhood in real life. The good, the bad, the ugly AF. Hosted by two women that are passionate about our beliefs and unafraid to speak our minds. Friends that wanted to create space for all that ish we are too scared to talk about. Are you ready to laugh, be vulnerable, and keep it real with us? Top knots are not required. If the Top Knot Squad content makes you laugh, not in agreement, or makes you feel less alone, we'd love your support in the cost of producing this podcast. Visit patreon.com slash Squad to learn more about our budget-friendly sponsorship tiers and how you can help ensure that TKS has a future. Every little bit helps. Um, so sex. Almost everybody does it and almost nobody talks about it, um, except for the squad, of course. Uh, we did tackle this topic in season one when we shared about our personal experiences with sex after baby. But today we are ready to dive in deeper than ever before. Today we're thrilled to have Miranda Wiley in the studio uh, to help us unravel all things sex, sexuality, body image, feminism and beyond. Miranda is the co-founder and producer of Bedpost Confessions, a live storytelling series here in Austin, and she also programs content for South By. Stay tuned this March for sessions on women's health, body hair, cultural appropriation, and as many conversations on intersectionality as possible. On that side note, those three topics aren't on our list of things to do. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe we should go to South By. Yes. Um, And it says you're an ex-New Yorker turned Austinite. So that is true. Um, and you also have a podcast uh, called The Scene Podcast, where you ask people to reflect on the ways they are seen or rendered invisible by loved ones, strangers, and most of all themselves. So welcome, Miranda. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for having me. This is such a delight. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> so your bio is pretty damn impressive. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> so we were like, oh, shit, we have like. Not that we're not a legitimate podcast, but we were like, we have somebody legitimate on the show today. Yeah, you curate for South by Southwest. That's, That's so cool. awesome. Yeah. yeah. What is that like? It's pretty phenomenal. Like right now, I'm just, we're, we're you know, um, a couple weeks away from it kicking off. So I'm just thrilled to see everything that come to fruition. It's a really rare position to curate something a whole year that yeah. then you have it happens in you know 10 days mm-hmm, yeah. so it's it's a lot it's kind of exhausting in that you're always thinking about the same thing over and over and over mm-hmm. again but uh, you know finding ways to make it exciting and so mm-hmm. like here now is is like yeah. it's the it's the part that I'm most excited about it's kind of like having a baby <laughs> it is yeah <laughs> it's like you the big long lead up to like oh shit here's the baby yeah now yeah. Now that that birth part is over with. <laughs> now comes the next 18 years. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, let's uh, tell us a little bit more about you and like why this is a relevant topic for you. How did you even become sex? S- yeah, life. sex is a relevant topic. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is a good question. I can <laughs> remember like one of my earliest conversations about sex was at a sleepaway camp. I was. 10 or 11, maybe as old as 12, and uh, someone was uh, telling me that she had had sex for the first time, Mm -hmm. and I just had so many questions, and she just basically said something like, and then he just put it inside. (laughs) And I was like, that cannot be the end of that story. (laughs) Like, what position were you in? What were you feeling? Like, what did y'all say? Like, Mm -hmm. I just kept asking all these follow-up questions, and and she just wasn't having it. She just was so irritated by me. Like, why? It just was not that big of a deal. Um, And then, yeah, from there, like, just always been curious about sexuality. And I think, you know, the creation of Bedpost Confessions came from a desire to create a space in Austin for the sex positive community and myself and the other co-founders we were all writing and podcasting about sexuality and we wanted to um, take that from beyond you know the mic or the uh, pay or the you know 
page on mm-hmm. on your computer screen mm-hmm. uh, and take it in on the stage and and create um, a place to celebrate sexuality so that that's where that came from mm-hmm. I was reading on the website so I, I guess the audience members can write down stories and then y'all read some of those yes, or, that is yeah. the that is the gem of the show that mm-hmm. is the like always the star of the show or the audience confessions. And mm-hmm. that's exactly right. There are these cards that say, I confess, and then people write um, different things. And then we, the producers, pick uh, different confessions to read and then read them mm-hmm. on stage. So That's awesome. That's very cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's a real... It's a real way to t- to have a sense of to take the cultural temperature, I guess I could say, mm-hmm. of what's happening um, in in our society, mm-hmm. um, and to also it's a way for people to get audience reaction to things, something mm-hmm. that they're curious about or nervous or something that like they feel embarrassed about, um, and to just have a reaction to that uh, mm-hmm. maybe it's like you know someone going like this is this comes up every once in a while like uh, someone like farting while someone was going down on them <laughs> 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 and just to like have a reaction and then like people be like oh yeah it's happened to me like <laughs> it just like it just frees people to for, sure. for stop it frees people to stop the shame of mm-hmm. sexuality and the mishaps that happen mm-hmm. so. I feel like maybe once you're in a good, committed sexual relationship, sometimes those mishaps, um, I know, like, my husband and I talk about stuff that happens. Like, if I make a funny noise while having sex or something like that, we can sort of joke and laugh about it later. But maybe if you don't have that support sexually with your partner or whatever, sometimes finding validation in other people helps normalize your behavior. And maybe you're not that weird for farting when someone goes down on you. (laughs) Maybe you were relaxed and enjoying it. It's actually quite common because you are relaxed. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, our previous episode was actually about pelvic floor. <laughs> oh, yes. Sullivan Physical Therapy. Yes. <laughs> phenomenal. I saw that. I was so excited to hear that y'all were talking with them because they're doing phenomenal work. We've yeah. had uh, a patient of theirs uh, talk about physical therapy and bedpost. I became a patient, which I was That's kind awesome. of thrilled to actually have a reason to go. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they're doing really phenomenal work. Yeah. So we've we've already been talking about sex and pee and poop (laughs) all things pelvic floor so this is a nice flow (laughs) (laughs) but um you mentioned shame which i think is really tied a lot for new parents um especially for moms uh, which is a lot of our audience so maybe we could talk about that a little bit um about this narrative of shame around sex and our bodies and you know being a sexual being after you become a mother yeah Yeah. so what are your thoughts i have a lot of them thanks for asking (laughs) uh first i want to make a recommendation for a book called untrue by wednesday martin and has a really long subtitle Mm -hmm. that i cannot recall Mm -hmm. but essentially she's taken um a lot of research that has been really like framed around uh male sexuality and has been documented incorrectly um Mm. and so just something that like you know uh, a women's sex drive declines and a a men's sex drive like stays the same and Mm -hmm. so like especially after having a a baby it tends to be like the mom is interested in sex so then she just starts to feel yeah some shame and just like i guess this is happening to me Mm -hmm. well there's actually a lot of research out there that it's not just like that this is happening to me i'm losing interest in sex is that women tend to need more variety Mm. and that is just the number one thing that women need Mm -hmm. Um, and so that might be like in terms of um, creativity new partners that also like a a sex killer in this research is um, living together interesting (laughs) okay what yeah what what about living together kills Uh, like for women more than men and a lot of this research is very heterosexual based Mm -hmm. but so a lot of um Women in their heterosexual relationships, they start to see their partner more in the familial Mm. range. And so like the pheromones and all those things that like drive you to want to have sex with somebody, like actually kind of do the opposite where you just feel like, I don't really want to fuck this person. This person just is my comfort Mm -hmm. and and I see them that way. I call it the sweatpants phase of a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So so where like this research, I think in this book is phenomenal is is that it's getting women to not think that 
that I'm no longer a sexual person. Let mm-hmm. me just wear a shroud and just say goodbye to my sexuality. Mm-hmm. It's like thinking about ways that you can cue back into your sexuality. So mm-hmm. like one of her tips is to do things that spike adrenaline, mm-hmm. like um, going on a roller coaster, a zip line, uh, mm-hmm. things like that that can really spike your adrenaline so that then it just confuses things in your brain, I guess. And she can, the book probably, you know, details this in great more like uh, (laughs) science terms uh but so that then you were like oh okay there's my sexuality yeah i I, like i want to fuck this person now and not just seeing them as your partner and co-parent um so that i recommend that book and then and then just sort of my own personal story um i would say like throughout like pregnancy and early parenthood and even just as parenthood continues on like honoring your sexuality which may mean you don't want to have sex Mm -hmm. and (laughs) yeah yeah so that was a very freeing time when um I was pregnant and I just you know my husband said to me we were were talking and and he said to me like I'm just not attracted to you right now Mm -hmm. and I just said oh my god thank you I'm not attracted to me either (laughs) like can we just take this off the table Mm -hmm. so we took sex off the table Mm -hmm. and instead we just connected and created more intimacy and like Mm -hmm. talking and but there wasn't this thing like this obligation that we felt like we had to do Um, it just wasn't there for us and it was kind of bizarre to or not bizarre it was uncomfortable to be doing a show about sexuality and to be visibly pregnant and then people are just you know coming up to me like oh aren't you so horny you're you know trying to, I was so horny and I'm like god no I'm not horny also like I've had a miscarriage as pregnancy for me is trauma mm-hmm. like I am working really hard to get through this mm-hmm. like the last like my sexuality is shut down mm-hmm. and I need to be I'm okay with that so I don't want you to be looking at me like you feel sorry for me or anything you know so just standing that ground so really honoring that of like that's not it's not there for me right now and then finding other ways when it does come back then I think there's the phase like the sweatpants phase can also get into the phase of obligatory sex right what's we all have to do to a certain point it's like okay, when you're with a long-term partner, you kind of just have to like, okay, well, I'm not really there, but let's just try. And then like, we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Um, But when you also take that off the table in a way, that can be really freeing. Mm -hmm. So like another thing that I've said once to my husband is like, I just don't fucking have the energy to turn myself on and to turn you on. (laughs) If you can make it happen for both of us, then great. If not, then no. And then it it won't happen because it's not authentic. And like early in our like um our life as being a parent which my our kids are uh, six and a half and four you know i think there was this thing this pressure to feel like okay well we still have to access our sexuality like if we're not having sex then our marriage isn't good and 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 then like really that obligatory sex like no one's enjoying it right it's not good yeah, I have two thoughts. So one is like our cultural definition of sex. I was actually listening to another podcast, um, longest what's it called? Longest, longest shortest, shortest time. time. Yeah. Um, so good. Yeah, they they had an episode I listened to about sex, and they were talking about how like the you know in the U.S. we define sex as penetration, like that's what sex means. But there's so many other things that we can be doing that meet that need, and it doesn't have to be narrowed down to just you know penetration um and i forgot my other thought but let's talk about that <laughs> yeah that is a huge yes that is so i'm so glad you said that because mm-hmm. it's a huge thing that we talk about in bedpost mm-hmm. confessions and working with the storytellers is that a lot of times we say sex or they as the writer of a story says sex but they're not ta- they're not necessarily talking about penetration they might be talking about Uh, intimacy just emotional connection they might be talking about numbing out Mm -hmm. they might be talking about numbing in they might be uh, that kind of sounds weird but do you know what I mean like getting connected to your body like Mm -hmm. feeling some emotional connection so it's not really numbing in that was a weird way to say it but it definitely numbing out is like when you just like want to shut down Mm -hmm. some some part of your body in some way Mm -hmm. Um, and then it can also be actual sex acts it can be like from anywhere from oral to uh you know 
manual with fingers and toys mm-hmm. and and so there's such a range and so to really broaden and and to call out what you're meaning when you're meaning sex and I think that was part of the thing of like when I was pregnant taking sex off the table didn't mean taking off connection or intimacy yeah, right. it meant taking off the act mm-hmm. of sex like mm-hmm. Uh, it also just felt weird to us. Like we felt like there was a third person there, which there was. That we, it was so like it was just kicking all the time, and mm-hmm. it just wasn't easy for us to block that. It just was so clear that that was a human that we were with, mm-hmm. and just did not make us feel sexual. But that didn't stop us from connecting. So yeah, yeah. all of those things. That was. Are you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say. I think it's great that you keep pointing out that sex does not equal connection, or that having a connection does not equal sex. Because I feel like, at least in our cultural narrative, it's a lot of, well, you need to have sex to satisfy your partner and you need to make sure you have sex once a week and sex begets sex and have sex even if you don't feel like it. You're going to get into it. And all of these kind of just really icky concepts that I think have been pushed onto women. And I understand that men will have these thoughts. They'll feel unsexy or they won't feel like having sex or they won't want to have a connection in a physical way with their partner. But I feel like so much of this burden is put on women to have to bear, especially after becoming parents. So I'm glad that you're bringing up the fact that one does not equal the other and they're not exclusively linked. Like you can have a connection without having sex. You can have sex without having connection. And that's all I wanted to say. No, no, that's (laughs) good. That's that's awesome. I, I just thought of I also when you were talking about your story, clearly communication is healthy in your relationship. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I think that that lacks for a lot of folks that are in relationship. And I was thinking a lot, too, just about like consent and how even that is blurred in our culture. And there aren't really a lot of conversations around true consent before you're engaging in something. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you have thoughts about that, too. Yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> Sorry, mean, that was I would say that script. that's even no, I don't think that's off script. I guess I'm just like, OK, how much do- how much can I say about you this right now? You can say no. All I just meant about, about like, uh, <laughs> like, is this too? Would my husband be okay with me saying this? But like, it's um, consent is still a thing in my marriage. Mm-hmm. So you know, when I was having sex with my husband in this obligatory way, uh, he finally told me to fucking stop it. Mm-hmm. Like he hated it, and I realized like I was doing this way. He wasn't consenting to it, mm-hmm. and and it was just gross <laughs> yeah not just for you but for him too yeah exactly yeah. and I just kind of thought I kind of got in that headspace of like well he's a man he just wants it all the time and he really didn't like it and didn't like it when I you know had that type of sex with him which I like have not had that kind of sex in ages now mm-hmm. which is nice to say mm-hmm. but it was a thing like certainly like um it was earlier on when we had just recently become parents. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I hear that so much, though, from women of like, you know, you said that too, like, I have to satisfy my partner. Um, and I'm always like thinking, I, I used to do a uh, sexual assault prevention education in schools with youth and so the the definition of consent is like drilled in my brain and it's it's permission that's freely given and so there's so many blurred lines with sex and so when at, when I you know moved into uh, marriage and then having children and like navigating my own sexual relationship it was just always at the forefront of my mind like am I is freely is this permission freely given like you know like but I don't think anyone ever since I had that background that was in my brain but like most normal people that's not like in the conversation of sex in their relationship Mm -hmm. so I don't know I was just thinking about like you clearly have like really healthy communication in your relationship and that's awesome that y'all are able to talk through that and reach you know a mutually agreed upon solution that that fit your needs yeah yeah Yeah. I I mean yes it's it's an (laughs) ongoing long conversation I Mm -hmm. mean this is you know we've been parents now six and a half years so Mm -hmm. that's been going on but I did want to say one other thing about sexuality um, and becoming a parent and the different ways to either honor it when it's not so present or how to honor it changing and part of it is honoring it when it changes because um or not because but rather we just had at bedpost this uh, storyteller in in the january show who um is a, a recent mom and you know went through that phase of thinking okay i'm not 
I, I just don't have any sex drive anymore. It's gone. And it turned out that she was looking for her sex drive uh, where or her sexuality, her erogenous zones, like in the same place where they were before her mm-hmm. pregnancy. And they're in an entirely different place now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And her body is all all different as most women's bodies. It's, it's just it's different. Mm-hmm. And so where you were before having kids is not necessarily where you're going to be mm-hmm. uh, after having kids. And I feel that. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, I feel I'm actually thinking, should I say this or not? But <laughs> I'm feeling that pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I the after our first, I was very like touched out and specifically around my breasts. And and that was something that existed for us in our sexual relationship. And I was just like, don't go near them. Yeah. Like, they're off limits. Like, don't even think about them or say the word. Like, I was so repulsed by my, <laughs> my body. Say the word. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but then it came back with my second, and I was really surprised by that. That's like, my story, too, to a T. And I was like, this is weird. <laughs> but I can, like take off my functional nurturing breasts and put on sexual breasts yeah. and be able to compartmentalize what I was feeling and not and I was not able to do that the first time around. And it's so interesting for me, too, because Rory, my first, um, we didn't have a long breastfeeding relationship and he ended up having formula. Yet I was so I was still so no breasts. Um, but I breastfed Rowan, my second, until she was 16 months old. So it's like so weird that, but but it can change I, even with your kids. Yeah, because I will say, I mean, I breastfed both both my kids, uh, but I only just got back sensation in my breasts in the last, like not not full sensation, but they're more erogenous to me now. Mm-hmm. Like now, in the last mm-hmm. like three months <laughs> I've not been breastfeeding for a long fucking time so it's not even necessarily connected to that I, I don't know it just yeah. it just came back in this way where you know just t- touching I, I get that sensation like oh okay mm-hmm. hello you're back <laughs> I yes. just kind of kind of taken it off it just wasn't there for me anymore and 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 you know I think that's something too of just saying like well all right it's fine. Where where else where else can I feel that um, erogenous area? Which I mean, you know, sometimes it can be the neck. You never right. know. <laughs> exactly, rubbing the feet or the back or the shoulders. Yeah, it can even be a part that doesn't normally seem sexual. Yeah, I get that. I'm. A, <laughs> I can't believe I shared that. <laughs> Don't be weirded out by it. I, I've already said some things that my husband will probably be like, why did you talk about that? I know, well, that's mo- I'm mostly <laughs> thinking I'm, I pretty I have a pretty like unfiltered like I just say whatever's in my brain, but I'm thinking of him. <laughs> <laughs> He's not that way. But so I wanted to ask a question kind of going back to the shame aspect of it. Um, and so this is a question that we've seen a lot of blowback, especially about celebrities, regardless of what they do, whether they're a singer or an actress or whatever, exploring their sexuality and putting themselves in a sexual light after they've become mothers. Literally, some of the comments I've seen on pictures are, well, she's a mother, she shouldn't be wearing that. Um, and I think people forget that, well, sex made her a mother or most likely made her a mother. I know there's complications out there too. But can you talk a little bit about how the concepts of motherhood and sexuality are not mutually exclusive and how they can kind of overlap? I know we've talked a little bit about how things can change, but can you talk about the idea that mothers cannot be sexual creatures? We just have such a complicated relationship with sex and our culture. It's so confusing. Mm -hmm. It's so confusing to navigate. Um. Yeah, I think that there that there needs to be more people who are. Um, oh gosh, I'm not like I feel like I'm not even that brushed up on pop culture, but the um, <laughs> for this question. But uh, who was it that did the pump pictures? Rachel McAdams. Yes, like that was that. Even I feel like that wasn't necessarily sexuality. Um, well. It was sexuality in a way. It was like fashion, sexuality, and breastfeeding. Right. And so it was this great combination of all these things coming together mm-hmm. where I think we kind of splinter them off. And yeah, it's like you're a mother and you're pious. And But even that, like breastfeeding is 
such a thing we just don't want people there's the whole th- anyways that's a whole other topic we're not here to talk about that but <laughs> i think we could talk about that topic for like three hours <laughs> i know i know i know i like yeah i mean my personal take on so much of that is like i just like to be in your face as much as possible mm-hmm. um just to shed a lot of that shame mm-hmm. um because i think that's the only way it changes right is if people see it well even that recent uh facebook thing that you posted uh Someone had put their status and then it went viral oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was like, uh, look for, look for the moms that, that don't have their nails, they don't done. have makeup or their nails done because and they have old iPhones because they're the best moms and they're the real moms. Who are like really paying attention to their kids. And it was just like, it like gave me rage, <laughs> but it was like, like it, the message is there even in subtle ways like that. Not even completely like that post wasn't about sex, but it was about how a woman is seen, Mm -hmm. um, which is connected to that. So it's really disheartening that that exists. And and how can we challenge that? I just want to add something not to to counter saying I want to be in people's face about sexuality, because I think there's also something to um, just being yourself and not having to claim so much. So mm-hmm. Bedpost uh, Confessions is was created by four women, um, all mothers. I was the last to come on as, as a mother. And we're all middle aged. And there's something about us just creating the show that um, whereas we're not always necessarily like in your face talking about motherhood and sexuality, it's the it's just present that that's who we are. And mm-hmm. and um, I think it has been the success of that sh- of the show is the fact that we are parents mm-hmm. um, and that there are that we see the complexity of identity um, and parsing out the different parts of our sexuality and the different time periods for, for your mm-hmm. sexuality. Mm-hmm. So that is an undercurrent of the show that is not necessarily so in your face. Um, but I, so I think it's like two, you need both of those. You need people who are calling it out. The sex researchers like mm-hmm. Wednesday, Adam Esther Perel is another fantastic uh, researcher. Um, she works a lot on affairs and, and understanding why people step out, which also, just about her work, she has this amazing way of picking out these key words. And the thing which talking about parenthood and sexuality, like the thing you hear a lot about is like that there's such little sleep. Like that's what people always will talk about is your lack of sleep and you don't want to have sex and being touched out. And she talks a lot about um, she phrased it in this way of like that a marriage is most vulnerable when the kids are under five five and under Mm -hmm. and hearing that word vulnerable it just it just reconfigured how so many people have talked about this concept but it's never really stuck in this way Mm -hmm. and so then I was able to think about okay my marriage and all these challenges that we were having and sure lack of sleep is one of them but also it's a fucking insanity to become a parent (laughs) and your marriage is vulnerable or you're your personhood is vulnerable mm-hmm. if you're a single parent or just your personhood and your couplehood, like all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so so she has these great ways of phrasing things like that. And the other thing that she's talked about is, um, is the fact that like women do say like, I'm touched out, but, but sometimes they're, they're not saying what they really mean, which is that I'm satiated. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm satisfied. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I've gotten all the oxytocin. I've mm-hmm. gotten all the feels. Mm-hmm. I don't I, I don't need anything else. Right. And so then what she talks a lot about for couples is the erotic connection. Mm-hmm. And so then sure, maybe it's not going to be sex like penetration, but like can can, you know, when, and again, this is still very like hetero modeled. It's like so if the woman's saying I'm touched out, I'm satiated. So great. But like still have have then the man uh, keep the erotic connection. So if that's like listening to music and just laying next to each other Mm -hmm. and maybe touching, maybe not touching, Mm -hmm. but um, just staying connected in that way of of what is your erotic self. So for some people, it might be music or dancing or working out or like, you know, the zip line and roller coaster and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be the way that we have the single focus lens on sexuality but it is the more the erotic Mm -hmm. self i actually read about that 
Um, a couple of years ago, I think, I gave a talk on breastfeeding and sexuality at a convention for parents, and it was geared towards natural parenting and things like that. And so I gave that talk, and talking to you about this just brought it back. And what I read was, I think it was the same person, but basically she said that there's four steps to getting that intimacy and that sexual connection back. And sometimes you can go all the way up to step three, but then you'll have to go all the way back down to step one. And just sort of acknowledging that it can be fluid and it's not going to be a linear process to get back to, especially after becoming a parent, to get back to maybe what you were doing sexually or how frequent it was or any of that stuff in a linear progression. It's going to go backwards and forwards and upside down and all of those things. So, yeah, I think that's part of what I ran into in just my personal experience. Yeah. I kind of thought, oh, like what we talked about with Sullivan PT, like, oh, six weeks, cleared to have sex, let's go. It's going to be great, and it's going to be just like it was before. And obviously it wasn't. It was totally different. Yeah. Was that specific steps? I'd have to look. I have it saved on my laptop. I'm just curious. Do you know if it was Esther Perel? Or... I remember the name Perel, and that's what sparked it for me. Now I want to I look it up. <laughs> yeah. I'll find it, and I'll email it to you. But yeah, I found it to be really interesting. And so if I'm thinking about the same person, then yes, a lot of what she said really resonates with me. And I agree. She does have great ways of putting concepts together and really impactful words and phrases that stick with you. Yeah, I wanted to speak to what you were saying about the vulnerability um, because motherhood like cracked me all the way the fuck open. (laughs) So it was like the most vulnerable time for me. I was very raw and just... I don't know. You could touch me and I would melt. I don't, it was like, like in a good way? <laughs> no, probably in a bad okay. way. <laughs> okay. I was my world was just turned upside down. So my I yeah. was I was I had to be figure out who the fuck I was and like I was reborn, you know. And I know that that can be an experience for a partner too. Like just you're responsible for yourself and just your relationship and now there's this other human that rocks your world so um or doesn't or doesn't yes that too which was part of my issue i i had postpartum anxiety and was struggling to connect with my son so um but anyways i just that really resonated with me that it it is a super vulnerable time where you're kind of reintroducing yourself to yourself and yourself to your relationship. And so it makes sense that sex isn't going to be the same or perfect and that you're going to have to kind of relearn that relationship too. So what do you think you would want mothers or at least new mothers to know about sex? To expect it to be different. um, And to look at other options Uh, There's a lot of emotions, I think, in being a parent and um, especially in my story, like it just became so much for my marriage to hold Um, Mm. and it was something that I needed to outsource a little bit and Mm. um, it's amazing to have some transactional sex relationships because mm-hmm. especially as a parent, like where we, I think are so um, trying to be efficient and thinking about our time. And I just don't have a lot of time to be like, I don't know, like doing the things that you're supposed to be doing that probably <laughs> Esther Perel recommends. Right. Uh, <laughs> like I don't have a lot of ramp up to be doing all the like, you know, the flirtation and, and, yes, and the, the yeah. yeah, like, mm-hmm. I, you know, and something else too is like, I just don't even care about going out to dinner anymore. Right. <laughs> like that just that is something that has come off the table for my husband and I over the last two years. It just there's so much like, yeah, I'm just going to say don't fucking do date night shit anymore. OK, fine <laughs> if it works for you. But like that shit it was it just was not fucking working. Mm-hmm. It's so much pressure. You have to book out a babysitter. And then uh, when, by the time that night rolls around, your kid probably didn't sleep well that night. You're both exhausted, but you both know you have to pay into your relationship. You've got to go out and do this. You can't cancel on the babysitter. So then you go out. And then what the fuck happens? Right. You get in a fucking argument. Yes. Yep. <laughs> 
Like pretty much every single time. Were you following me around on Saturday? <laughs> it's a really expensive argument. It's <laughs> so fucking yeah. Oh yeah. Not good. Yeah. I I will say we've tried to shift to day dates. Yes, which we did that recently. Helps yeah, because the night we still like, like get to go to sleep. Pressure. Well, yeah. the whole like losing sleep to like yes. go get in an argument was not working for us too. So. Yeah, we went. We had a babysitter come and we went and saw a matinee movie, mm-hmm. and that was a delight. Yeah. Then we went out and had coffee afterwards. <laughs> yeah, like, <it> awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's something. So I think it is in this way. Thinking now, I'm thinking about talking about sexuality and thinking like, well, your dates probably need to look different too yeah and also it's just uh, restaurants are fucking loud and it's so much you're just like kind of shouting at each other and you've been shouting at the kids all day long like i just it's like sensory overload yes (laughs) yeah and then the last thing i want after all of that is to be touched and by that time i'm just done like I want a quiet room and covers. Yeah. Yeah. Which actually that same podcast, they talked about this a little bit too and said, Dan Savage said Uh, that you- Fuck first. Yes, you have to fuck first. Yeah. Because if you, it's not going to happen when you get home from the date. That's so true. Yeah. (laughs) So anyway. That gets a little bit complicated with the babysitter and the evening and all that. (laughs) When he was talking about it, I was like, but the babysitter's there and I guess we have to go find somewhere else. Like (laughs) we, so then, yeah, that's the thing we've shifted to like morning sex, like get the kids Mm -hmm. off to school and then come back to the house. It's empty. Mm -hmm. And then like have a shag before you go to work. Yeah. Everybody has a better day. Probably. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, you said in your bio, uh, you're a storyteller who advocates for sexual literacy and emotional justice, which I also wanted to ask you about emotional justice, and whose feminist lens serves her in parenting away from the boys will be boys mentality. Um, and I really loved that because boys will be boys is like nails on a chalkboard for me. I cannot fucking stand it. Um, and so I just wanted to hear more about like, what yeah. does that look like in your parenting? Wait, do y'all both have boys too? I have two boys. Yeah. I have one. You have one. Okay. I have two as well. Okay. So I think it looks like just stopping a conversation when someone says that to me Mm -hmm. and just saying no. (laughs) (laughs) That's not, that's not okay. Um, Mm -hmm. Because I think that that does, that's where the conversation begins. Um, And, you know, my boys are really fucking wild. They're Mm -hmm. fucking high energy. We are out um, of the house most mornings. Like this past week, I had to get out of the house like at 6.30 a.m. Like, and they had played on an hour on the playground before school would even open. We're like on Saturday mornings, we are out um, at the bike, uh, the bike pump track, like 7 a.m. Like, and, and so many times when I'm talking, telling these stories, people are just like, oh, boys will be boys. Or we're like, when they're wrestling in the aisles of Target, mm-hmm. which happens a lot, yeah. <laughs> uh, boys will be boys. And it depends on like how my, how I'm feeling. I, I just try to, I might, it might just be as simple as just being like, n- no, or, or <laughs> no. just not agreeing with them, yeah. just like dismissing it. Um, so and I think it, it's also then the bigger conversations come, can come in like when friends or family or, or people will be saying that. And and uh, yeah, so it, that's the kind of the start of it mm-hmm. is just stopping people from saying it. How do you respond to folks who, you know, come at you with like, no, there's like actual research that, you know, boys are biologically different and they need rough and tumble. Yeah, and they need to do this and they have more energy. Because I I feel like I've heard that before, like uh, boys will be boys is not like an excuse for their behavior, but it's just a fact that boys behave differently. What is your response to that? I just say I I politely disagree. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And what I generally believe is that my husband and I are really intense, active, productive people. And therefore, it's no surprise that we have kids that way. And so they uh, want a task. 
They mm-hmm. want to be engaged in something. They want a project. Like they're very project based. They like want goals. They so I kind of will refocus the conversation to that. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't necessarily I don't think have to. I mean I'm a woman and mm-hmm. I'm a part of the DNA that made this up. So then that brings me into the conversation right. and makes it not just then about like oh my two boys and my husband and they created this. It's like well I think this is like our personalities and they're showing right here right now. And I definitely was the more of the wild problem child, Mm -hmm. like high energy, high maintenance. Um, And my brother was, my younger brother was not that. And my husband was definitely like, you know, the more gregarious, like challenging person. So it's like, I kind of take it back to our story of origin to Mm -hmm. make it clear that I think that this is more biological to our personal DNA history than it is about boys specifically yeah those are my (laughs) those are my kids like my daughter is my wild child and my son is not the stereotypical boys will be boys at all like he's just very sweet and laid back and like not those things and she's crazy so (laughs) I wanted to ask about emotional justice can you talk a little bit more about that and what that means that's a good question I think it means a lot of different things and to kind of tie it into this conversation I think it is honoring your story um, and coming to some sort of reckoning so in a storytelling mode which happens you know at bedpost it kind of also happens at at South by if there's some sessions that are more you know person personal based it, it's a way of, you know, just even the creation of this podcast, because it's it's saying like that we are here, we want our voices to be heard, and we are against the norm. But the norm is not the norm. The norm is only what's been told to us. Mm-hmm. And so finding some um, justice uh, in, in your own story and then other people's story and making it more collective. So mm-hmm. I think for me, like there was great emotional justice in uh, when it, finally all my pregnancies were done, um, like telling my story about pregnancies, about miscarriage, about trauma, and just mm-hmm. that m- my story of pre- not every, every pregnancy is a good one. Not mm-hmm. every um, pregnancies uh, is not necessarily a happy time. Pregnancy is trauma. And mm-hmm. so that that to me was just even just being able to say that mm-hmm. and to um, still have that be a part of my story. It's just it just is very liberating. I feel I felt a lot of justice um, being able to share that story for people who who really had a hard time understanding me when I was in such a dark place Um Like with my last pregnancy with my last son, like it just was it was very, very, very traumatic. And Mm -hmm. and so like I I lost friendships because people couldn't really hang with me. Like I couldn't I was I just couldn't I was fucking dark and I still am that 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 forever changed me. Like when you're talking about um, being broken open in a way like that forever, forever changed me. And there's kind of no going back to that. But so there's just this this thing of them being able in writing it's this beautiful craft of being able to tell a story and to be able to take people through it and I think finally when I was I told that story when I was a year out um, from being my last pregnancy and so being able to craft this this these language and these words and these details and these anecdotes and and then people finally like were like fuck because they couldn't be around me then Mm -hmm. you know and I couldn't be around them but that they could we could all kind of celebrate like that it was done Mm -hmm. and it and we were all could kind of come back together and and just like just exhale just Mm -hmm. we did it it's Mm -hmm. done and that's kind of that's how my story ended is like Mm -hmm. uh which my uh, my, not my husband my my child like he became early like you know essentially like if science and medicine hadn't intervened like we would have both died like Mm -hmm. that's that's like where things were and so the the story it ends in this beautiful way of just like he and I holding each other which I mean it's the story but it's also true of just just that just exhaling and being like we did it Mm -hmm. we did it we did it and so that just was very (laughs) (laughs) it gets like what I have to to go back and read that story like sometimes I can't I I will just like open up the the draft and look at it I'm like oh I can't go there I can't go there yeah. but but that's what I mean like emotional justice is like it's it's a lot of times it's something very dark and bringing it to light and 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 honoring it in a way and feeling like that you can be present about it and you can talk about it um so that's beautiful <laughs> yeah I relate to that definitely on a different level 
My last pregnancy was also really difficult. Same thing. I lost a bunch of friends. I actually lost a bunch of friends after my son. Uh, Anyway, it was a big fucking mess. But now, four years later, I'm finally at the point where I can talk about it and not feel like I'm going to either rage or cry or both at the same time. Yes. Rage or cry or both. (laughs) Yeah. Usually both. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Totally. Yeah. Totally. So that's like that's emotional justice is being able to get to that place and then being able to maybe you go back to those friends and, you know, you're able to like connect with them in a a different way and Mm -hmm. be like kind of sorry, but not sorry. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. That's how I feel about the whole situation. Yes. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about scene and all of that? All of that. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So this podcast was started from this project, this creative project where essentially like you hire yourself to explore some project that's always been in the back of your mind uh, and you've just never had the time. You don't just don't devote the time Mm -hmm. uh, to yourself to like explore it. So I did that and I said, I am not going to create a podcast like at the start (laughs) of it. And then, sure enough, I ended up creating a podcast Um, because it came out of this scene list, which essentially I just started to write my own scene list, which a lot of it came from being pregnant. And when you're pregnant, like why people want to talk to you, I don't know. (laughs) Like why they're invested in the sex of my child, why they like care when it's due, why they care, like any of it. It's none of their business. Mm. So... Um, that dichotomy, uh, so be, I was so filled with rage and so filled with um, just anxiety and depression. Mm-hmm. Um, but then people were just constantly bombarding me with like this cheer. Mm-hmm. And so this dichotomy of like how I was seen and how I like how people were seeing me and how I saw myself. And so I just started to keep this list of these moments in time where, you know, people were saying things to me, um, you know, or how how I wanted to be seen and how I wasn't seen. Mm-hmm. And um, so I just read it out um, to Mariah, who actually came on board as my my producer. And and I just like, this is this is what's coming out. I, I don't know. What do you think? Do I? And she's like, yeah, you've totally got something here. Like, mm-hmm. you know, keep keep going. And so from there, then it just became this framework to be able to have a conversation with people. Um, so I asked people to write five ways that they have been a uh, seen or unseen, like rendered invisible. And then uh, they read this list at the top of the of the show. And then we have a conversation about it so that's so cool that's awesome it's like Thank quite you. literally yeah. like I think our podcast was born somewhat out of that and that we didn't really feel seen in this world of parenting and we wanted to talk about the things that we don't talk about and the things that aren't seen in this mm-hmm. world and then even the work you know I'm a maternal mental health therapist and literally every single client that I ever work with that comes up as I yeah. I don't feel seen I don't feel heard I'm not being validated in my experience um and it it's harmful it is right <laughs> it is yeah and I think but I think what's interesting about doing this project is that it's made people think of like essentially they're hiring themselves to be the therapist mm-hmm, in some way mm-hmm. so it, it, it um, causes people to think a bit about you know they might have some misdirected anger sometimes mm-hmm. of like how you know someone's not seeing me in a way but it's like but what are they putting out there you know right. so they're kind of like wrestling with this stuff and there is like there are some people who have had some stories that where emotional justice has come up like mm-hmm. in terms of you know just this family strife that went on for so long and then finally like got through and you know this daughter and and this father had this connection and had this conversation where it's just as she says like the scoreboard was gone they were Mm -hmm. finally able to see each other Mm -hmm. where they just were were missing each other for so long and and it's some it's 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 insane kismet I, I love that word because it, it's a, a thing that just happens sometimes. Mm-hmm. It's it's whatever it is where, like, our walls drop and we just feel some sometimes comfortable, sometimes strangers. Like, you can just feel have that feeling about somebody and you just feel completely seen by them. Mm-hmm. And they've ne- you don't know them from anybody else. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. And it's just amazing kismet. And so also that with like, you know, a history, a a relationship and a family dynamic where it's just not, not, it just wasn't happening. And all of a sudden, at some point, they had a breakthrough and they were able to really like connect and see each other. So that's all the things that we. That's awesome. That sounds amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, but also thank y'all for doing this work here because that's that's part of what I think that, that y'all are doing here. I mean, you've already said it, but that's what I saw in like researching your podcast and listening to it and like checking y'all up on the gram and stuff. I was like, oh, <laughs> they are very much about identity and like yeah. trying to reframe and, and speak their truth about like what it is to be a parent and, mm-hmm. and all these different facets. So. Yes. It's more than cute little pictures with letter boards and babies and fucking bonnets and who gives a shit so. <laughs> yes um so where can people find you uh so i did just recently get on the gram um <laughs> to be seen so my handle is seen with miranda as a bit of a nod to like i think that we're all trying to be seen on social media so mm-hmm. come be seen with me mm-hmm. and uh then bed post confessions uh website bed, bed post confessions uh, we're also on instagram and um I think that's about it. And your next show is in April? Oh, yeah, which I brought postcards for y'all. It's April. We're doing – it's now quarterly, um, three-show run. So it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's April 24th, 25th, 26th, I think. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being on here and enlightening us. Yeah. Thank you. If the Top Knot Squad's content makes you laugh, nod in agreement, or makes you feel less alone, we'd love your support in the cost of producing this podcast. Visit patreon.com slash Squad to learn more about our budget-friendly sponsorship tiers and how you can help ensure that TKS has a future. Every little bit helps. If you like what you hear, then be sure to click the subscribe button in your podcast app. While you're there, leave us a review. You can find us on social media. Just search for Top Knot Squad. We welcome your feedback and love making new friends. 